Welcome to the first day of week four of the Art and Science of Drawing. And for those of you who are going through the entire series in order, welcome to day 16. I really want to congratulate you for coming this far and sticking with this program. The skills that you've learned in the previous three weeks are really going to provide a solid foundation that is a real investment in your future as a drawer. So in week four, we're going to take the skills that you've learned about volumetric drawing in week three and expand on them to really provide you with the skills to draw virtually anything. Today, we're going to start a conversation about how to draw compound form. Now, what compound form is are objects that are composed of two or more of the foundational volumes that you learned about in the previous week. And for today, we're going to be focusing on compound forms that are made up of spheres and cylinders. So you'll notice that at this stage of the Art and Science of Drawing series, you'll be asked to perform many of the skills that you learned in previous weeks. This includes circle drawing, ellipse drawing, straight line drawing, and the ability to observe and analyze form. If you're struggling with any of these skills individually, I would encourage you to continue to practice the basic skills. And remember, these aren't so much basic skills as they are fundamental skills. You cannot practice fundamentals too much. I still make it a regular practice to draw circles, ovals, and straight lines, just because they're so common in drawing. Over the course of my career, I have literally drawn tens of thousands of ovals, circles, and straight lines, and will most likely draw tens of thousands more just because they're so important to continue to practice. Now, before we get to our subject today, I want to remind you that you should be spending 70% of your time simply observing and analyzing the subject that you're drawing, and only 30% of your time with pencil to paper. Remember, it is not an accident that the word observation comes first when we talk about observational drawing. Now, oftentimes, when you're working with compound forms, you'll find that the familiar volumes you're used to, like cylinders and spheres, have been altered in some way. You'll find that cylinders will taper or will sometimes be bent, or instead of finding an entire sphere, you'll find a partial sphere. Nevertheless, we can still approach these subjects with the same strategies we've been using. We just want to make sure that we're being flexible enough to alter the strategies depending on what we find in the subjects that we're drawing. By now you should be familiar with the idea that instead of trying to name objects, it's critical that we as artists translate what we see into the most basic volumes. For today, we're going to ignore the handles and focus simply on the largest volumes. You'll learn how to draw forms like these handles later on this week. You can see here how easily this form simplifies down into a cylinder, a sphere, and a series of ellipses. There's not a single shape here that you don't already have experience drawing. Now, let's focus on the vertical axis line. Notice that the axis line also acts as a line of symmetry for the entire object. When you're constructing symmetric objects, it's critical that you first draw a center line. This will make it much easier for you to evaluate whether or not your drawing is symmetric. In today's demo, it's the first thing you'll see me draw. Next, let's focus on the two largest volumes that make up this object. Let's start with the cylinder at the top. You'll note that this cylinder tapers and gets narrower at the top. While working with compound forms, it's common for there to be more than one way to think about a volume. This type of volume is very common, particularly when you get to figure drawing. You can either think of it as a cylinder that tapers and narrows toward the top, or you can think of it as a cone that's been truncated. Either way, you arrive at the same volume. Next, let's focus on the sphere that makes up the bottom section of this object. You can see here that this volume is nothing more than a sphere that's been sliced in half. By adding back in the ellipses, we can get a sense of all of the prominent volumes and shapes that make up this form. You'll see me begin by drawing a vertical center line. Every time I draw a symmetric object, I begin with this kind of center line, as it makes it much easier to evaluate whether or not my drawing is symmetric. Next, you'll see me mark the top and the bottom of the object. After establishing the largest proportion, you'll see me make my first attempt at locating the bottom of the cylinder. Remember, 
At this point, we're working primarily by sight. You'll be introduced to a wide range of measuring techniques during week 5. But until then, I just want you to get used to evaluating and comparing the proportions of the big shapes and volumes. Here, you'll see me using light marks to make my first attempt at the width of the ellipse at the top of the cylinder. As the drawing progresses and I learn more about the object, you'll see me move these proportions around. It's important to remember that that's the whole reason we draw this lightly at the beginning, to make sure that we have a lot of flexibility and that we can easily change our drawing. So far in the Art and Science of Drawing series, I've been advocating starting every drawing with the biggest shapes first and slowly working your way down to the smallest shapes. Although that's the most common method most masters use to draw, it's one of many potential strategies. In this demonstration, after figuring out the largest proportions, you'll see me start with the shapes at the top and work my way down. Remember, there's no one right way to draw, and it's up to you as an artist to figure out a process that works for you. After making my first attempt at the ellipse at the top, which will almost certainly be changed later on in the drawing process, you'll see that I've drawn the ellipse at the bottom of the cylinder, keeping in mind that it's wider than the ellipse at the top. Every time I draw a new shape, I'll compare it back to the shapes that I've already drawn to see how it relates in terms of size, placement, and proportion. The ellipse at the bottom of this cylinder is not only wider than the one at the top, but also more open because it is below. Next, you'll see me trying to find the width of the object at its widest part. You'll notice that I'm comparing it back to the ellipse that I first drew. After checking to make sure that each side is the same distance from the center line, you'll see me make a mark indicating where the largest ellipse in this object is located. This ellipse is by far the widest that we've drawn so far, and because it is also below the other two ellipses, it is once again more open. Now I'm ready to draw the sphere located at the bottom of the object. Beginning students are often surprised to find that although only the bottom of the sphere is present in the object, I'll still draw the entire sphere very lightly. I find that it's much easier to draw a partial sphere by beginning with an entire sphere and only darkening up the visible portion. Finally, you'll see me place the ellipse at the bottom, which will also, of course, be the most open. You can see now that the form is beginning to take shape, and I can begin the process of sculpting these basic volumes into the more complex object that we're working with. Notice that at this stage, the drawing is still light and soft. I can keep the drawing in this vaporous state as long as I need to continuing to sculpt the form and make adjustments until I'm satisfied that the drawing has believably captured the object we're working with. Only then will I begin to darken and solidify the drawing. But even as I begin to darken lines and solidify the object, I'm still always looking for opportunities to adjust any part of my drawing to better capture the object. At this stage, I can also begin adding the nuances and details to turn these basic volumes into more complex forms that better describe our subject. I'm paying particular attention to how the cylinder at the top transitions into the larger forms at the bottom of the object. Next, you'll see me start to draw the ellipses that make up the rim at the top of our subject. Keep in mind that for today, we're editing out most of the details and focusing on the basic volumes that make up the object. Later on this week, you'll learn more about how to draw handles and rims on subjects like this. But until then, try and keep your drawing simple and structural. Once I'm satisfied with the construction of my subject, I'll begin to use line quality to darken the lines I want seen by a viewer. This is a great opportunity to practice some of the tools and techniques that you learned about in Week 2, the dynamic mark-making section of the Art and Science of Drawing. The final drawing of this compound subject consists of a light foundation of basic volumes that I've used as a scaffolding for the darker lines I want seen by a viewer. Being able to do simplified, structural drawings of more complex forms is a critical step towards being able to do more finished work. You can see these tools and techniques put to good use in this still life here. Notice that almost every object here is either cylindrical, spherical, or some combination of the two. Now let's focus on the wine bottle, the carafe, and the water glass. Notice that the ellipse at the top of the wine bottle is at eye level, 
so it simply appears as a straight line across. But all of the ellipses below it, regardless of their widths, become more open the further below eye level they get. The carafe in particular has a remarkably similar structure to the object you saw me demonstrate today. The more you practice these tools and concepts, the more similarities you'll find between different kinds of objects. This is why it's so important to not learn to draw a specific subject, but instead learn the tools and techniques that will allow you to draw any subject by observing and analyzing its form and simplifying it down to basic foundational volumes. Now for today's project, I'm going to ask you to go find a compound form that is made up of cylindrical shapes or spherical shapes. We're going to learn a lot more about how to deal with boxes later on this week, but for today, let's just stick with spheres and cylinders. Now my advice is that the compound form that you choose should be pretty simple. One of the most common missteps I see while people are learning to draw is selecting subjects that are way beyond their skill level, and this inevitably creates problems down the road as they're learning to draw. So be patient. We will be at complex forms before you know it, but until then, it is much more important that you get comfortable and develop a competence drawing these basic forms. Once you've got your compound form, I'm gonna ask you to observe, analyze, and draw this form using all of the strategies that you've learned thus far. Now remember, it's not important that you capture every single proportion of the object accurately. I'm much more interested in you getting a drawing that looks believable rather than perfectly accurate. In week five, you're gonna learn a whole series of measuring techniques that are gonna allow you to refine these basic kinds of drawings to truly capture the specific proportions of an object. But until then, I want you to do drawings of objects that appear to be believably occupying space. So that means you really want to pay attention to the level of openness of the ellipses and to make sure that even though some of the ellipses will be smaller, that they get more open the further down they get. And you also want to keep in mind the rules of perspective. Now I'm going to assume that if you've made it this far in the Art and Science of Drawing series, that you're very serious about getting good at drawing. So I'm going to encourage you to go beyond the practice that I'm giving you. Remember, I'm only giving you the minimum amount of practice. If you want to get better, faster, increase the amount of practice you're doing. Instead of simply doing the project that I've asked you to do today, practice things from previous weeks. Remember, these are fundamental skills that you cannot practice enough. And you can also increase the number of times you're doing the project. So instead of drawing your compound form just once today, try drawing it three times or six times. And each time, ask yourself, what can you do to streamline this process, to get a little more accuracy, or to better use the strategies that you've learned thus far? Remember, knowledge is not enough. To be a good drawer, you have to be willing to put in the hours of practice that it takes to really learn and hone these skills. Well, have fun practicing, and I will see you back here for day two of week four or day 17.